Welcome back to Vivid Noise, and I've been in a bit of a PlayStation 2 mood, so I thought, what better game to play than the Burnout game that not a lot of people talk about? That being Burnout 1, because, you know, Burnout 2 has a bit of a following, and Burnout 3 is Burnout 3. Let me start by just saying that this game has held up a hell of a lot better than I was expecting it to. I came into Burnout 1 expecting it to simply be Burnout 2, but just not as good in every single aspect, and to a certain extent that's true, though the game is still very fun on its own, and now that I've played it a lot more, I really understand why it was successful in the first place, because I was getting ready to claim something along the lines of, oh, I have no idea why it even got a sequel, but no, no, it's a very solid and keyword, very legible arcade racer. A lot of games from the sixth generation specifically suffered greatly when it came to legibility, as in because a lot of games at that time ran at only 480p unless you were on PC and very lucky, it would often be kind of hard to see what was going on because the overall level of detail would be far greater, but the resolution was still pretty low, so you were cramming a lot more down a smaller funnel, so to speak, compared to the N64 era when, yeah, the resolution was even lower, but the visuals were so simple that oftentimes it was still pretty easy to tell what was going on. Well, with Burnout 1, things are very clear. There's no excessive post-processing, very few particles, and you got these massive arrows on the side of the screen to let you know which way to go when you got a corner coming up. The font is nice and bold, the colors are vibrant, but not oversaturated. It's just a very well-presented game, especially considering its time and status as a sort of, you know, not triple-A game. This isn't Gran Turismo we're talking about. This video isn't just gonna be me gushing over this game though. I'm primarily making this video because I really want to talk about the different kinds of evolutions of a series, or in some cases, devolutions. So something that I noticed about Burnout is that it's a classic example of what I like to call the missing ingredient series, as in you have one particular entry that implements one little mechanic or just changes something up a little bit so that you basically have what we know today as the identity of that series. So with Burnout, it's burnout free. That is the burnout game that you know as what burnout is and from that point on. Before that, the games were still, you know, arcade racers, but they're almost unrecognizable in terms of their presentation and gameplay especially. The addition of the takedown mechanic really was that next big step that missing ingredient that put this series on the map, at least for a time. And when I say at least for a time, yes, I am referring to the death of the series, but I'm not gonna lie. Let's not pretend that Burnout died just randomly. It's because it was consumed by Need for Speed. See, EA knew there was no point in having two different racing series, even though to the general public, it doesn't really matter. It's just driving a car. So when you present your average NPC type person with either a racing game where you drive around in a generic no brand car just you know crashing stuff or you get to crash into stuff and also run away from the cops and use weapons and do it all in a Lamborghini what do you think they're gonna pick what I'm trying to say is burnout didn't die for no reason it died because that's what made financial sense it saddens me too but that's just how it is. Anyway, getting back to the whole missing ingredient thing, I noticed it's not exclusive to Burnout, obviously. If I had to pick some examples outside of the racing genre, Mario Free definitely comes to mind when it comes to platformers. It's essentially the game that laid the blueprint for what modern 2D Mario games would end up being like, so be it the new Super Mario Bros. games or Mario Wonder, with the addition of things like a world map and being able to store items, toad houses, etc. For as weird as it may sound, I also think that the Call of Duty series had that that missing ingredient moment with modern warfare that really is the game that marked a change even though there had been prior games that involved modern warfare outside of Call of Duty. Race of X got a good video about that from a few years ago, but you still get my point though, that it's not always a matter of mechanics necessarily, because I'm not really sure if Call of Duty 4 really changed that much mechanically, although I'm sure there's some multiplayer stuff someone could tell me about, I'm not really into that, but it was the presentation, the fact that it was now modern warfare, that's what made that difference. Come to think of it, missing ingredient type series are actually a dime a dozen, for example, Street Fighter or Far Cry, but the thing is, with those games, that moment when everything changed was with the second game, whereas with Burnout, or Mario in this case, it was the third game, or Call of Duty, it was the fourth game. It's interesting how it really is very different depending on the series, when exactly it happens, when exactly you have that missing ingredient added. Because when you think Street Fighter, 
you think Street Fighter 2, right? No one really thinks about the original Street Fighter, and while the original Far Cry kind of had its legacy continued with the Crisis games, which I'll talk about a little more later, it really wasn't until Far Cry 2, and then most notably Free, that solidified the franchise's presence in the gaming world. Then there's the other kind of game series progression, the kind where the identity of the series is already there from the first entry, and each subsequent entry just builds upon that and changes a couple things here and there, but the core is still there. I find that that's most common with platformers, like for example, I can go back all the way back to Sonic 1, and apart from the lack of spin dash and all of the other characters and stuff, I still feel like I'm playing like a Sonic game, there wasn't like some big shift, despite the fact that the gameplay has definitely seen its fair share of alterations. A more relevant example to what I'm showing you here, that being a racing game, would be Gran Turismo. Yes, the production values have seen massive boosts over time, the music has changed, the overall presentation has changed, but I personally still feel like I'm playing a Gran Turismo no matter which one I'm playing, be it the first one or the latest one I've played, which might be the PSP one. I haven't played anything past that. But even with stuff like 7, 5, and 6, I can still tell you still have that Gran Turismo core, despite the controversy surrounding 7 from what I've heard. And then finally we have the kind of game franchise where the identity of it is extremely strong for the first entry and maybe an expansion, and then it's all downhill from there. A particularly egregious example I can think of would be Fear. While I was never personally the biggest fan of Fear, I still can't deny the sheer presence the original game had. From the way it presents itself to the way it plays, it really does have its own unique thing going on with the bullet time mechanics and the pseudo horror elements. And from what I've seen, the first expansion for the first game was also pretty good, although Perseus Mandate apparently has some serious issues. But then with each game, so Fear 2 and Fear Free, things just started to change and again, I haven't played those games to be honest, so this might be kind of ignorant, but it seems that it's partially due to consolification, and also just due to taking the story in really weird directions. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also the case of Crisis, which started out as basically the can you run this game kind of game, although it did have very open-ended environments and genuinely fun gameplay. It allowed you to take all sorts of different approaches to how you assess a certain area. It really was that spiritual successor to the original Far Cry. But then with Crisis 2, it seemed that they made the game far more linear, and essentially essentially turned it into a typical action shooter with a sci-fi aesthetic. The game was still very good looking for its time, but obviously because it was trying to also be on consoles, it couldn't quite push things to that next level like the original did. And then there was Crisis Free, which apart from being yet another game from the early 2010s where the main character has a crossbow, from what I've gathered it seems to open the environments back up a little bit while sort of combining it with what Crisis 2 did, and obviously the game is still very very pretty, much prettier than Crisis 2, so much so that at the time, not even Total Biscuit's computer could run the game maxed out. The main conclusion that I'm drawing from games that have sort of lost their identity over time is that either the developers or most likely publishers simply don't understand the original appeal of those games, or maybe they do understand it but simply believe that trying to aim for an even broader demographic would be more profitable. But if something like Serious Sam is anything to go by, you really can't underestimate the niche. There will always be an audience for a specific kind of game. Even if initially it isn't massive, it will grow as your games continue to move in that same direction and improve. While I'm no businessman, I can still tell you that I value something far more when it has something unique to it, and unapologetically stands against being homogenized. That probably explains a lot about my taste, doesn't it? Anyway, thank you so much for watching another episode of Vivid Noise. I'll see you guys next time.